We are going live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live. Good evening, everyone. Today we have our chairman, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, sir, who is teaching us about uh, uh, MIPO in proximal humerus and humeral soft fracture. Uh, in in this uh, webinar is through the Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India and Ortho TV. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Janki. Uh... Uh, today's this talk is basically uh, as uh, as a last minute gap uh, filler for Professor Taneja, who unfortunately was busy with some inspection. So before I start, I have to acknowledge two people. Uh, one is Professor O from Korea, CWO, who and uh, Dr. Tirachai from uh, Chiang Mai University in Thailand, both of whom uh, have been involved with uh, minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis for many years. And uh, uh, having been on faculty with, for various courses with them, uh, have learned a great deal from them as well. So starting with, uh, we're going to do this in two parts, first with the humerus and then with the uh, uh, proximal humerus fracture. So remember that most humeral shaft fractures can be managed non-operatively. And as John Chandley said, that it was probably the easiest of long bones to treat conservatively. Uh, the basis of non-operative treatment is that most of these fractures unite. It does avoid complications associated with surgery and perfect alignment is not essential for good function of cosmesis. And Klenemann showed that uh, you could get a reasonable amount of deformity and shortening without any problems with function, as you can see that even if the fracture unites in that position, and this is just at union, so by the end of it, uh, uh, one would expect complete recovery of function. Conservative treatment works. There's an example. This is from Professor Coxon Kong from uh, Sing uh, Singapore, and you can see that over a period of years with uh, an initial hanging cast and then a uh, uh, cast brace, which a functional cast brace, this has gone on to feel satisfactorily. So the general uh, treatment, if you're treating them conservatively, is to keep them in a hanging arm cast or a cooptation splint, something like a sugar tongue splint for seven to 10 days, or maybe even less till the pain and swelling subsides and then switch them on to this uh, Samiento brace, okay, which is, you can get off the shelf. Uh, it uh, basically works on the principle of the hydrodynamic forces created by the muscle, helping union. And the idea is to keep the limb moving, especially flexion and extension during this period. And uh, these were the uh, results of Samiento where 97.4 uh, healed satisfactorily with conservative treatment and 98% achieved full or near full radial motion. And most of the radial nerve palsies also recovered with conservative treatment. These are in, uh, mostly in closed fractures. However, if you look at it a little more uh, closely, you can see that almost a third, that is only 620 out of the 922 patients were followed up. So, there was a certain number of patients who were not followed up adequately. Now, there are certain fractures which do better with the internal fixation. Okay, so any fracture which requires nerve or vascular exploration, the very distal or very proximal fractures are difficult to treat conservatively. And the so-called Halston Lewin fracture, Lewis fracture, which is involves usually the distal third with the comminution, comminuted fragment, usually would require surgery, and these are often associated with radial nerve problems as well. The other option is a locked intramedullary nail, uh, which is a minimally invasive uh, treatment. It's good for some of the complex fractures. Uh, you get good healing rates, however, not so much in the transverse fractures, and may be useful for pathological and osteopenic fractures. Uh, the standard approach is 
uh, just lateral to the head in the region of the tuberosity. So you are going through the rotator cuff. Uh, here's an example where a fracture has been treated conservatively with a nail and has gone on to heal with good function. However, there are certain problems where you can have damage to the rotator cuff tendons. Uh, the, as, uh, the intramedullary canal, especially in our patients, are often very narrow distally and can cause problems. Uh, you can get atrogenic radial nerve injury, especially in, uh, by stretching, etc. And uh, very rarely you can get uh, neuro, neurological rather than vascular injuries at the interlocking sites. So this is a classical example where the fracture has healed, but the patient is not happy because uh, the shoulder, his shoulder is hurting and it didn't hurt before the surgery. The other thing is you have to be careful about some of the locking screws, right, which may be very close to the axillary nerve as well as the radial nerve more distally. Uh, transverse fractures have a, a sort of a tendency for non-unions and delayed unions with the nails, especially if there's any distraction at the fracture site. Although the more uh, sort of modern generation of nails do have the ability to compress at the fracture site. When it comes to surgery, uh, open surgery for plating, uh, I think they work well in terms of healing but you do end up doing a fair amount of uh, stripping of soft tissue, which may devascularize uh, fragments, especially in a very comminuted fracture. So there is a need for a good alternative, which provides you stable fixation, which is biologically friendly and safe to both the shoulder and the elbow. And this uh, minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis uh, was written about by, this was the initial uh, sort of cadaveric study done by Tirachai in Chiang Mai. And they looked at how it was possible to do a minimally invasive anterior plate osteosynthesis of the humerus. So in, incidentally, the first case we did was way back in 2004. This was a patient uh, with a segmental fracture and a very narrow medullary canal. So this may be a fracture. If the canal was wider, we may have nailed. But because the canal was very narrow, we decided to do a MIPO technique here. <coughs> so you can use, even though the fracture was very displaced, you can use a conventional screw to pull the fragment into place and get a reasonable reduction with a bridging type of fixation. Although we have one screw in the middle fragment. And you can see how this has gone on to heal well with good function. Since then, there have been many papers on minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis of the humerus. And this paper by Kong Feng Luo et al. from China or Shanghai uh, really felt that MIPO should only be done for comminuted fractures. And we tend to also continue to do that only for very comminuted fractures. Although, uh, uh, various authors have shown good results for simple fractures as well as with the mipotechnic. So this would be a classical example where uh, the fracture is extending quite distally. So nailing would be difficult because it would be very close to the olecranon, to the fossa, to the olecranon fossa. And uh, so here, what we used uh, was a minimally invasive technique. This is a distal incision. So usually you go uh, to retract the biceps and then on the brachialis, you can see the muscular cutaneous nerve. Your incision is made a little more laterally in the middle of the brachialis and then you can expose the distal part of the humerus and more proximally, again, anteriorly, just beyond where the bicipital groove, you can make your incision there. And then you slide your plate either, you can do it in either direction so, uh, superiorly to inferior or inferior to superior, uh, you do this in an extra periosteal submuscular plane. And once you've got the plane aligned, you can put in your screws to fix the fracture. And this is what it looks like at the end. And if you look at this, you'll be very worried about healing. But because this has been done biologically without disturbing the soft tissue, and then 
with movement, you can see how gradually the fracture fragments align in well with a good function. I guess it's got a good function as well. Uh, there are some problems with MIPO. Uh, it's not that it is very easy to do in every situation. There can be some technical difficulties. And of course, there may be a fair amount of radiation. So you need to try and re reduce the amount of uh, use of the image intensifier. And if you get malalignment, you're likely to get non-union or malunion. So it's important to get length alignment and do it as biologically as possible. So if you have a large fragment, uh, so this is not a very complicated, you've got one single large fragment, and these are the situations you have to be a little careful because if you miss the large fragment altogether and this fragment is away, that may be a situation where you could get delayed healing. This was quite an obese gentleman who we decided to do this technique many years ago. This was in 2005. And you can see over a period of time that fragment has remained apart. And you can see over time, there's been a little bit of distraction also at the immediate uh, fracture site. And over a time, this fracture has failed to unite. And then eventually the plate broke after 10 months. And we had to do a revision fixation, uh, get uh, a plating with bone grafting done. You can see there's adequate bone graft there. We used a long plate with multiple screws to get a kind of absolute stability. And this then went on to heal uh, satisfactorily. Although this fragment is separate, the main fragments have gone on to heal well. So uh, this uh, paper by Oetol, looked at plating of humeral fractures and compared standard conventional plating versus minimally invasive plating and found that you did not increase the incidence of either nerve palsies or a delayed unions or non-unions. In fact, they did better than conventional plating in most situations. So how the various tips and tricks, uh, you can use an anterior external fixator and then try and slide the plate uh, just lateral to your fixator so that you can still put it on the anterior surface. You need to, ch you can uh, check your alignment on both views. So get your X-ray to turn around so that you're not rotating the uh, uh, sort of uh, arm when you're trying to get your images till you've got some fixation done. And this is a case from Dr. Who again, where you can see how with minimally invasive fixation, it's gone on to heal satisfactorily. Uh, so there are some problems with using the anterior fixator because you can have difficulty in visualization. Uh, another way would be to use multiple pins, but there you risk nerve injury and takes a longer time to perform and not so easy to control. So one way of doing it is to just put two screws, one proximally, just uh, proximal to where you would pa pass your plate from, uh, which again, these are thick shan screws, and then put one distally uh, at the lateral epicondyle level where you're safe from the radial nerve and you go exactly transversely at these levels parallel to the joint. And once you do that, you fix, you uh, attach an external fixator to your shan screws. Okay, so you can fix that with a, uh, external fixator, connect them with a, uh, the two pins with a rod, and that will hold things reasonably apart, reasonably in line while you can do your plating. So here's a case. This is an interesting case, which was being done by one of my colleagues. I was there till uh, the initial part of the procedure. And once the fracture had been passed through, so I assumed everything was okay. A few minutes later, I get an SOS call from the OR and I went back and reviewed uh, the images as the, uh, it was progressing. And you can see what happened because the canal was a bit narrow, distally, which wasn't obvious. You can see as the nail went in, it just gradually totally disrupted the distal fragment. And uh, by the end, it was uh, a situation like this where the nailing was not going to work. So what we did was, again, we used this two pins proximally and distally, and then passed a plate and fixed it minimally invasively. 
with three screws proximally and three screws distally. And this is her follow-up. You can see how nicely this has gone on to heal with a good function. So MIPO can get you out of uh, difficult situations where you're trying to do a nailing, etc. Okay, so this is important. Uh, how you do your nail, uh, you can do a nail assisted MIPO where if you have difficulty in reduction, you can use something like a titanium elastic nail to provisionally align the fragments for you and then pass your nail uh, through. So all these uh, various tips and tricks would help you to do a minimally invasive fixation in these uh, uh, problem cases of the proximal humerus, of the shaft of humerus. Now we go on to the proximal humerus. Uh, so where and when would you use MIPO? Uh, you can use it in various situations, uh, but uh, our indications are mainly for two or three part fractures, especially if the greater tuberosity is significantly displaced while the neck is minimally displaced. So this would be the classical uh, indication where we would use a, a phyllos type of plate for a, a sort of a proximal humerus fracture. The other situation where we would use MIPO plating is where you have a proximal humerus fracture with an extension onto the shaft, especially with a lot of comminution uh, of the proximal part. So this would be another situation where a MIPO technique would be useful. Remember when we talk about MIPO, we are not only talking about minimally minimal in, in, minimal incisions or stab incisions, what we are talking about is minimal damage to the soft tissue. This should always be kept in mind whenever you're planning to do MIPO techniques. So this would be the classical type of case where the greater tuberosity is slightly displaced. You can see the fracture extends onto the neck or this sort of situation where there's an extension with comminution onto the shaft of the fracture. Remember, you have to uh, uh, go under the axillary nerve. Uh, your incision is not normally this long. This is to show the position of the axillary nerve. So your incision is normally only about five centimeters from uh, the acromion, uh, extending down from the acromion process. And you need to go into the uh, subbursal space, okay? So get under the bursa outside the rotator cuff, and then you have to pass your finger under the axillary nerve and feel it. And if you abduct the shoulder, it relaxes the ulnar nerve, uh, the uh, axillary nerve. And remember you have, the nerve will lift up to about 13 millimeters off the bone, especially with abduction of the shoulder. So that is enough room for you to pass your plate. But remember when you're passing your plate, stay very close to the bone. So these techniques are important. Uh, Usually we do this in a beach chair position for the MIPO technique. So the arm is draped free and make sure you can see all the CM images before you start your surgery. So usually a proximal incision, as I mentioned, was just five centimeters. In the junction of the anterior and middle third of the acromion, you need to incise the bursa under the deltoid to get onto the level of the rotator cuff. Okay, if there's a greater tuberosity, fracture, you need to get that reduced and provisionally hold it with wires and then abduct the shoulder and feel the axillary nerve. Check the length of your plate. So what we tend to do when we are doing this is to not use the uh, proximal humerus guide that is there with the phyllos plate. We tend to just use some of the sleeves proximally, slide the plate down and you have to be careful that the plate remains in the center on the lateral view so that it doesn't slide anterior or posterior. So feel the axillary nerve, abduct the shoulder, get your plate very close to the bone and then gently pass it down and make sure it's a slightly longer plate in most of these situations, okay? So you have to go down to the level of the deltoid incision and sometimes even go through the deltoid incision where you have to put a longer plate you need to prepare the tunnel so that the plate can pass through without any problem. So this is the case I showed before where you have a tuberosity fragment and a neck fracture. That's the proximal incision. That's the mark of the distal incision. You slide the plate down. We just have a sleeve on it. You put a wire on into the plate distally. Make sure the plate is well situated. 
and then go on to do your fixation. Okay, so this would be your fixation. This is <coughs> using the top limited screwdriver. And that's your immediate post-op x-ray. You can see how <coughs> they have not put any screws in the region of the axillary nerve. Here's another patient, again, displaced, greater tuberosity, minimally displaced neck fracture. This is uh, another plate, uh, proximal humerus plate, not the phyllos plate, which we fixed. Again, you can see we put three screws distally, and you can see how nicely this has gone on to heal with a good function uh, using this technique. So as I mentioned, the other situation where we would use it would be shaft extensions. There are a few reduction tips for these proximal fractures <coughs> where there are neck fractures. You can use things like traction. You can use uh, a joystick onto the proximal fragment if it's going into varus and then tilt it into the valgus or the correct alignment position. You can use a mallet in the axilla to push the distal fragment more laterally. And of course, uh, put provisional K wires to hold your reduction. Make sure you felt the ulna nerve before you slide your plate down. And even the plate can be used as a reduction tool. Uh, if the shaft is a me bit medial, when you put your first screw, put a conventional screw and it will pull the fragment and reduce it. So these are various tips and tricks for the tricks for the proximal humeral fracture, which would help you reduce the fracture and then go on to fix it well. So as I mentioned, the next situation is where you have a proximal humerus with a shaft extension with prominution. So this is the classical example, and uh, here you have to do, uh, again, get with traction, get a provisional reduction. Uh, again, a beach chair position is used, is preferable. You can do it in the lateral, uh, in a supine position, but it's useful to have it a bit elevated. Again, you can use either a deltoid spit or a deltopectoral approach proximally. And distally, it can be anterior or lateral, okay? So if you put it straight down, you have to go lateral. If you put it uh, a spiral kind of plate, then you can go anterior. <laughs> okay, so the anterior distal incision, you need to, as I mentioned earlier, identify the musculoskeletaneous nerve and don't try to put humans on the lateral side because remember the radial nerve is close by. If you're using a straight plate on the lateral surface, Always identify the radial nerve. Otherwise, you're likely to get into problems. If you're using a long plate for some of these fractures, which have comminution and extension onto the shaft. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the incision is on the lateral border of the biceps. The biceps is retracted medially. Identify the musculocutaneous nerve. So all these are very similar. The distal part anteriorly is very similar to what you would do. <coughs> for your numeral shaft fracture MIPO techniques, okay? So here's the patient. This is a patient where you'll see, you can see comminution. Uh, there's no significant intra articular, that means there's the fracture, although it's very comminuted and very proximal. Uh, there are no uh, head split fragments as such, but a large tuberosity fragment. And you can get that provisionally reduced. Here we use the deltopectoral incision proximally, but kept the plate on the lateral side and went all the way down laterally. And you can see, we've used this incision to identify the radial nerve so that the plate can go under the radial nerve without damaging the radial nerve. So this is very important if you're putting a straight plate going on to the lateral side. Okay, so the other thing you do here is go through the V of the deltoid. So it's a long plate. Uh, if you go either anteriorly or posteriorly, you will not be along the humerus. So you go through the V of the deltoid, which is on the lateral, make a small incision there and you can get through it. And here is at follow-up, you can see how this fracture is healed up very well with a good range of motion. Here's another case. Uh, here what uh, you can see the CT scans. And here uh, we used 
the concept of the spiral plate. This was written up by uh, Fernandez uh, many years ago, 2002, using conventional plates, but we can use it with the long fillers or the locking plates as well. And we need to bend the plate. So this is a long plate. You need to bend it into a spiral. And the way we do it is hold the sort of proximal part of the plate in a clamp in the plate bender clamp. Okay, so you can see how this clamp is used to hold the proximal part of the plate tight. And then with a pair of strong pliers, what you can do is go to the end of the plate and gradually just twist the plate while you're holding this. So this should not move and you just twist the plate using some force to take some strength, but hold it carefully, make sure that's not moving. And you can see how the plate is being twisted into a spiral, okay? And now if you see the proximal part is in a vertical direction while the distal part is almost in a transverse fracture. And when you do it this way, it'll sort of bend or twist almost evenly, okay? So now you can see how the two sides are in different directions. You can have the proximal part on the lateral surface and the and uh, the distal part on the anterior surface of the unit. So this is how it's done. You can just slide this plate down. And here you don't need to worry about the radial nerve so much because the plate is more anterior distally and more proximal. You put multiple screws proximally and distally. And this, because the screws are in different direction, also gives you a very stable fixation. Okay, so that goes on to heal well. Here's another case. Again, this is a shaft extending onto the proximal humerus. Again, here we used a couple of circlage wires to get the fracture fragments together. You can see how with the wire, you're reducing the fragment and then we're putting, uh, passing a long phyllos plate along the lateral side. And this is here, you, of course, you need to identify the radial nerve so that you don't get any problems. And you can see how this is also healed very nicely within a short period of time. So what are your take home messages? So starting with uh, the humeral shaft fractures, remember that not all humeral shaft fractures need internal fixation. They can be managed conservatively. I think conventional plating uh, and today with uh, the lock plates for osteoporotic bone are still the gold, gold standard. Uh, nailing is appropriate for some fractures. And nailing is also coming into the proximal humerus fractures with the proximal humerus nailing systems that are now available with direction, multi-lock direction of screws, as well as the ability to tie on the tuberosities onto the screws. So this is something which I have not covered in this talk, but today you have nails which allow you to actually deal with even three-part uh, proximal humerus fractures, and some people would even extend it to four-part proximal humerus fractures. Okay, uh, MIPO is really a useful alternative in some difficult situations. I showed you some of the situations where it can be used. I don't think you should use it as a routine for all humerus fractures, although there are people who do that. I would kind of reserve it for the very comminuted fractures where nailing may not be a suitable option because of either a narrow medullary canal or because of where the fracture extends to. So you don't want to do it in those situations. Be aware of the indications, the techniques, and the limitations. This is important for you to understand. And coming to the proximal humerus fractures, again, remember that uh, there's a definite role for MIPO in proximal humerus fractures. I think, as I mentioned, the best indications are displaced uh, tuberosity fractures with uh, sort of less displaced neck fractures. Uh, conventionally, for really displaced three-part or four-part fractures, we are still using the lock plates. Occasionally, for the neck and three-part fractures, displaced neck and three-part fractures, we started using the nail. But for the four-part fractures and the very displaced three-part proximal uh, neck fractures, we are still using, are more comfortable with plating. Uh, remember, proximal humerus fractures with shaft extensions is again a very useful indication for these. Again, what's important is for you to learn the techniques, select your cases carefully, and take care when you're performing the techniques so that you get a good result in these cases. Because if you don't, then you're going to get problems. Thank you very much for the patient hearing.
Uh, I will take questions now. I have to stop sharing. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, we have a question from Dr. Avinas. You want to know how much malalignment should be acceptable? So I showed you the figures from Dr. Klenerman. So you can accept easily 20 degrees of uh, angulation, uh, maybe 15 to 20 degrees of rotation, and 2 to 3 centimeters of shortening. Okay. So, sir, even if it is a virus malignment, we can accept? Yeah, like, about 15 to 20 degrees. If you won't show, if you see some of the fractures which are treated conservatively and heal in virus, you actually can't tell from outside that it's a virus. Yeah. It's been like a uh, shaft. Are... Obviously, if it's near the elbow, it becomes quite obvious. Yes, sir. Like, sir, not... when we are putting the uh, cast also blindly, it usually is in the virus. So, yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. So when you, so you have to try and avoid that when you're treating them in a cast. Uh, you, even though you will end up with some virus in a lot of cases, one of the ways suggested is uh, actually casting in extension, which was uh, in, uh, incidentally uh, uh, written by Codman many many years ago, but. Uh, uh, has been a method that has got lost. Today, most people would do it in flexion, but uh, there's always a tendency, especially in the uh, sort of heavy uh, bodied person, uh, especially ladies, it becomes very a big, uh, there's always a tendency for the fracture to go into virus. So you have to be careful. So another question is asked is, uh, can we do MIPO if, it is uh, the patient is presented with the radial nerve palsy. Yeah, so the case I showed where it was grossly displaced was actually one with a radial nerve palsy. Okay, so I think you have to be careful. Uh, you need to talk to the patient about it. But uh, it depends on your philosophy on radial nerves. Okay, so we tend not to explore them in closed fractures. Okay, unless there's a very strong reason for it. Uh, like a Holston Lewis fragment where you suspect that the nerve may be either entrapped or lacerated, but that is not, not usual. Uh, so most of these we tend not to explore, even if we are plating them anteriorly, we don't go looking for the radial nerve. If you are plating them posteriorly, then of course you have to uh, look for the radial nerve because it comes in your way. Okay, So for the anterior plating, we don't always go looking for the radial nerve. Uh, so I do not, so what do you need to be sure that the radial nerve is not entrapped? Now, there is some work with ultrasounds to do this, but it's not really caught on in a big way. Uh, I think it's not easy, but if you get the correct probes, etc., you may be able to see the radial nerve on ultrasound and really locate where it is. And that may be an indication for exploring the nerve. But otherwise, for most, like you saw in... Uh, uh, Samiento series with uh, with uh, close treatment, 66 of the 67 radial nerve palsies actually recovered without exploration. Uh, uh, you have shown that uh, in the lateral approach, in the proximal humerus fracture, uh, to avoid axillary nerve injury, we actually need to palpate the axillary nerve. So. How we can palpate that? So that's why I said you get into the space underneath the bursa, underneath the deltoid. That's important. Abduct the limb and make a space close to the bone and put your finger in there. And as you sort of uh, pull on it, you can feel the axillary nerve. It's thicker posteriorly and thinner anteriorly. So you have to go a little more posteriorly to feel, feel the nerve. Okay. It's like a taut structure going from posterior to anterior. So, uh, one more thing uh, which we come across is usually when a fracture is fixed in virus, usually virus get progressed and finally... Uh, the so, why should you fix? Are you talking so, about yeah. numerous fractures? Yes, sir. So that's one of the things you have to be careful about is to make sure that you get the correct inclination of the head on the shaft. Okay, so that's, you have to take 
make effort to make sure that you're not fixing it in virus because uh, once you fix it in virus, there's a greater chance of it failing. Okay, uh, sir. Another thing uh, which uh, is that when we are putting the nail, uh, where should be the entry point? So it depends on the design of the nail. The, so the new nail, the multi-lock nail for the proximal humerus fracture, the entry is almost centrally on the head. It's actually through the articular cartilage. And the, the advantage of this is that you're not actually going through the rotator cuff. You're going through the muscle of the cuff the, so of the supraspinatus rather than going through the uh, tendinous part of the rotator cuff. So that can heal better. There's less chances of getting problems with the rotator cuff. And it's a straight nail. Okay, So it, you have to be center. Otherwise, you will get into virus. Okay? And that it can be a bit difficult. The idea is to push the head anteriorly so that you can go a little more anterior. Uh, if you try to go lateral to the chromium, it's very difficult to get into the center of the head. So push the head anteriorly. Uh, some people do it open. Some might do it close, but you need to try and go more anterior so that you can get into that central part of the head. So, uh, as you have shown for the segmental fracture, uh, which one to be preferred, sir? Is it MIPO or nilling? I think, see, the, if it is a comminution in the center of the shaft and the canals are wide enough, okay, I would go for nailing. But if it is an extensive comminution which is going close to the uh, olecranon area, olecranon fossa area, or the canal is very narrow, which is not uncommon in Indian patients, then a mipo plate would be a better option. Okay, because you saw the case where with the nail you had, and we've uh, I, I have one case where there was severe thermal necrosis of the distal shaft of humerus, which I showed in the last meeting, yeah. as a result of trying to put a thick nail into a thin medullary canal. So mm -hmm. we have to be careful about that. Uh, so that one, the same case which is published, sir, I think thermal necrosis, sir. Tendon muscule, is it? Or? Did we, did we uh, do, show that case? Yeah, yeah. That, that yes. and the distal radius one. Yes. Uh, and so one more thing, sir. When uh, how to decide the approach, sir? Like uh, when to go for for especially for the soft fracture when we are doing by MIPO, when you use the lateral and when you prefer the anterior one. Or so, so for uh, shaft, we always go anterior. Huh? Okay, Although there are some reports of posterior MIPO technique, uh, but I would be a bit worried about it because you're going uh, very close to the radial nerve. So we tend to go anterior in most, and that is what I showed. And there the radial nerve is not a problem. The problem is when you use a plate from proximal to distal and you want to, it's a straight plate usually, so it will tend to come straight on the lateral because proximally you have to be lateral. So there are two ways of doing it. One is to angle it slightly anteriorly or you have to twist the plate to come anteriorly. Okay. So you have you can decide between the two, but if you're going straight lateral, make sure you explore the nerve and make sure the nerve is safe. Okay. Because we've had one patient who, uh, I, I didn't show that case, but where uh, the plate was literally... There was one screw literally close to the nerve and it did develop a radial nerve palsy. And in exploration, luckily the nerve was safe, but the plate was actually pressing on the nerve. And so, uh, like for the deltoid fibrosity, what we can do for when we are going for lateral approach? Because So we go through the V, okay? So the deltoid insertion is like a V, okay? So go right through the middle of it, you can... Uh, use scissors or something to go or you can make a small incision there to in the tendon. So you're not damaging the tendon because the tendon is attached over a wide area. If you go through the apex of it, you'll go straight down the lateral side. This is a trick I learned from uh, Dr. Coxon Kong from Singapore. So uh, when you 
uh, usually for the comminuted fracture, as you mentioned, the MIPO technique, why not for the simple fractures? So by and large for simple fractures, what is your principle of fixation? So uh, for that is absolute stability we should achieve. Yeah, so you know, so the what you're trying to achieve okay. is open reduction and comical reduction and yes. absolute stable fixation, which you can't do with MIPO. If you uh, use a MIPO, you get a reasonably good reduction and you bridge the area and leave many screws free at the fracture site, there is a good chance that this fracture will heal. But <clears throat> the non-unions are also in these simple fractures more than in comminuted fractures. Okay, so you have to be careful about using it in, in simple fractures. And in simple fractures, your conventional plating works very well. Okay, so you don't want to take a chance of doing something which is like, which may possibly fail just because you want to do a MIPO technique. Okay? So, uh, so you are not worried about the vascularity, etc. Okay, in a multi-fragmentary factor, you are worried about the vascularity of the small fragments. Okay? And so, uh, if you mm. please, please suggest some uh, technique to avoid the insufficient reduction in MIPO. Please would. So I mentioned the techniques now. One is an external fixator guided thing. The other is a nail guided thing. Okay. Other, other than simple traction and image intensifier verification of your reduction. We need to get length, rotation and alignment. Huh? Okay, so if you're not getting it by simple traction and this thing, you can use an X fixator where the pin distally and proximally just pull it out to length and put a rod so it will hold it there. And the other thing is to uh, pass a tense distally to proximally so that you get the fragments rough. So you're not looking for anatomical reduction, you're just looking for decent alignment. Yeah. So I think uh, most of the questions we have covered, sir. And so it's a very okay. uh, so, nicely done. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay, bye. This was a little bit last minute, so yes. maybe some minor mistakes in the slides, but that's yeah. unfortunately I couldn't really go through them well enough, but otherwise, okay. Bye. Yes. Thank you so much, sir.